So what are you boys' uh, thoughts? On the topic in, so what are you boys' thoughts on the topic in question? Uh, I've liked seeing the cars on track. I think they look really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I've really loved seeing them out. I think they look so nice. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I was very sort of like hesitant on how they were going to look. Um, but after, after seeing, you know, I haven't watched any of the testing live really. Mm. Um, the only time I turned it on was when the Cephas car actually shot itself. Um, <laughs> that was the only thing, that was legit the only thing I saw live. I turned it on and just watched the car go bang. And I was like, they're oh, cool. Right, cool. We are now actually live, by the way. Uh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> They'd actually had uh, Albon in the commentary box, and I think he'd mentioned right. something about t- rear tyre temps and like, oh, yeah, we'll just put some flames on it. And then and at that point, it went... Yeah, they cut yeah. to the picture of Latifi's rear brakes on fire. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh... it, was good, it was good timing to have Alex Albon just chatting in. Literally, like, oh. as he stepped onto the mic, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Come on. Is that the... No, that's... Oh, you do got to love the fact that YouTube Studio does not does not understand that when you're live streaming via Zoom, it doesn't come up in your videos until someone actually clicks on it and watches it because then it comes up as a real-time view. Oh dear. Oh, welcome everyone to the live stream. Feel free to chat, by the way. I'm still trying to just this up. So I'm just trying to dig out some very brief notes I was making throughout today. I'm trying to stop my cats from fighting with each other. Still can't get over seeing Haas. That was a cheeky little move to get... Um, oh, Magnussen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'll love it. To be fair, though, that's a... Like, it's a, I it's, it's a good good idea. Yeah, I know the times don't really mean anything. It was clearly because it was in that extra little bit of time. Yeah, we weren't it? Um, mm. But that's a it's a decent move from where they were. Like oh, yeah. two, two years of not doing anything. Has yeah, two, two, two torrid years for Hass, and now it does seem to have got them up a bit. Yeah, well, they, they, they did say last year that they're focusing all their resources on. This yeah, they didn't, they didn't even use the two tokens they had available. They only used the one. Um, yeah. Just, I guess, on a, on a resources basis, just save everything for next year or well, this year now. Yeah. I recorded my uh, podcast for this week, uh, this morning, and I described Magnuson's arrival and obviously the fact that the car is quick is that they're a bit like relegation fodder in football to like Norwich. But if you gave Norwich... Ronaldo, something something like that. You know, now they've got a, a person who's genuinely capable of fighting for points mm. in that car. Obviously, Mick is still an unproven prospect. Well, but this it, is meant to be the year that he actually. Well, does it, well yeah, so second it? season and all that with Mick, isn't it? Yeah, second season syndrome. Uh, fucking bit of bullshit, if you ask me. Uh, oh, uh, we're uh, live on each. Yeah, don't worry, don't worry about it. Like you can swear on the At podcast. least I, I wasn't the first like one thing, to but... swear live on uh, live on air. I know, yeah. Well, it's it's not the first time, but yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to tone down on it, but I'm Welsh, and it's just like part of my DNA. <laughs> Comes that. That's <laughs> my it's my excuse. <laughs> What's everyone calling the uh, the Mercedes? Side pods. What's your name for them? What side pods? <laughs> exactly. What side pods? <laughs> That's why I said side pods. 
I gotta say, I was I was reading something earlier about like the the big upgrade packages that had come to this uh, test. It is great to see that with, there is actually development pathways uh, across the grid. They the cars do look very distinctive from each other, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they do. I like the, the variety of the front wings because uh, obviously that's the first part you see. So mm. if they all look the same at the front. You know, it's like, well, they all look the same at face value. But all the front wings are drastically different. Yeah. It shows, like, just much of a different, like, philosophy, is that the right word? Um, that you can follow. Because, like, um, I feel I've got quite a level front wing. A Mercedes uh, a much, like, a more aggressively loaded one. So they're clearly just chasing downfalls. Yeah, they're all quite different. And like, it, it reminds me of the um, the change in 2019 when they had to go either like more inboard or more outboard with them. Be interesting to see which, which yeah. one comes out on top. Because what, yeah, what, what's come what comes to my mind, I think, is not one team as sort of like you know with Mercedes in 2014 where they they just smashed everything i don't think yeah. one team has has nailed mm. every part of the car so i think you'll be looking at a bit from everywhere to to yeah. find the perfect car yeah and uh, it's good. yeah i see what you mean i think a lot of people are pointing towards red bull to be the guy to lead the charge but not it won't be like Mercedes. Well, that's what people seem to be think, leaning towards anyway. I mean, everyone's still solving the porpoising issue, aren't they? Mm. So I think this porpoising is like, the more I read into it, it's like the more of it, it's actually like really simple to fix. Like the fact they fixed it when ground <laughs> effects like came in, like way back when. Like all you have to do in, is just... In theory. Yeah, I mean, in theory, all you have to do is raise the ride height of the car and it doesn't... Do yeah, well, yeah, but they don't want to give up that extra gram of downforce. <laughs> so... They, they don't, I mean, yeah. the engineer will look here and it's like, oh, well, at least we're shaking that dense gold out of the driver's fillings, aren't we? <laughs> we'll find out who does have fillings now. Yeah. That's even good. <laughs> I think it was, I was reading. Yeah, the... Everyone's going to be sponsored by Colgate at this rate, I think. <laughs> That's the 2019 Williams, isn't it? Oh God, yeah. Was it called? Was it Aquafresh? Aquafresh. Yeah. One of them. Yeah. <laughs> I was really disappointed because, of course, they had that rocket livery and then rocket pulled out like just before the season started. I was like, oh, it's a shame. Be good so then rocket sponsored yeah. everything else. Yeah. Big Susie With Wolves, wheels. Um, Formula E <laughs> team at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Then they, they, they sponsored uh, the races online events, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Rocket is a weird company. They make like a really, really eclectic mix of things. Do they do like phones and like? Well, they know from phones. Yeah. What else do they do? Well, I, I, I looked them up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to look it up again. But phones is the initial thing. But they then have like vintage clothing, <laughs> and then they have like all sorts. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you go to Rocket.com. Yeah, phones, drinks, services, Wi-Fi, e-book, e-bikes, sorry, content. Is that, what does that mean? I think they're just a, um, I say just, it, it sounds like they're a, um, a sort of startup investment company. Mm. Right. Well, at least they're Let's sold. Let's like, get cracking um, with this. At least it's not rich energy. <laughs> Cracking with this before we uh, <laughs> rant on too much of funny. As he got round to sorting everything out, let's uh, actually start recording. <laughs> I don't rant. What do you mean? Okay, I'm ready to go when you guys are. Yeah, good to go. Okay. Oh. Testing is now over, and it's time to get serious as we head into the new era of Formula One. Welcome back to the Grid Control Podcast. This is episode 173, and today we're going to be discussing the final preseason test in Bahrain and looking ahead to the 2022 season. Today, I am joined by Aaron Harper from the Five Red Lights Podcast. 
Hello. Uh, Tom Downey from the Everything F1 podcast. Hello. And engineering master, Jack Watson. Hello. Yeah, we started with that years. <laughs> it feels like years ago, Jack. We're not getting rid of it. So, um, yeah, we've had three more days of testing, this time broadcast and actually shown so we could actually see what was going on, which was, which was nice. Um, and Aaron, I'm going to start with you and your favourite team, Mercedes. It's, it's been a strange test for Mercedes because while the drivers keep saying, yes, we're quick, it, well, no, not sort of like it's quite obvious that Mercedes are quick. But the drivers are saying we're not as quick as Ferrari, we're not as quick as Red Bull. Lewis even saying that we may not, even, they may not even be competing for wins this year. How much of that do you actually believe, or do you think this is just what Mercedes do? Say that everyone's faster, and then come out and beat everyone by a second when we get to Bahrain. Uh, I don't believe any of it because, first of all. The primary caveat to any of this is that testing is notorious for being misleading. I mean, Prost ran under weight all those years ago in a bid to get sponsors and they look like the real deal. With Mercedes, I think it's just them playing down expectations. Everyone is expecting them to come out with the best car. Everyone expects them to be constructors champions again because we're just so used to it. We're so used to them delivering on the track. Uh, as for not fighting for wins straight away, I mean, that, that's a real possibility because if their porpoising issues are continuing and they haven't quite got on top of it, then that might restrict how well they can run their car. And it, the car obviously is fast. I mean, it's got less drag because it's got no side pods. I mean, that, that's a good start. Um, and that's definitely caught the eye. And they, they've ran reliably. They've done some really good long runs. They actually did the most laps in Bahrain on 384. But actually, to me, it looks like they've created a bit of a, another diva uh, in that it has a very precise operating window considering the porpoising issues that they've got. So if they can't get the maximum out of it, it's going to be when they arrive at a track that doesn't exacerbate the porpoising problem until they've got on top of it or one that just maybe suits their car's handling style, which I think we're going to see with quite a few uh, teams. Um, their fastest lap was about a second slower than than the fastest lap overall of the test. So I didn't see Mercedes do a performance run, like a low fuel lap, like some others did. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I, I think they know what, what they're doing. I'd hope so. You don't win eight constructors titles by accident, but they definitely haven't shown their full hand yet. And I don't think we will see it maybe not even in Bahrain because they might not be able to, which, you know, potentially bodes well for the rest of the season because at least they'll be coming through and there'll be that, that sort of chase through the season. Yeah, it's, it's definitely mysterious what's going on at Mercedes. And Jack, I was going to come to you next to talk about some of the sort of the more engineering side with the fact that Aaron mentioned, you know, the fact that Mercedes have turned up to this test with a radically different Sipod or lack thereof of sidepods design that they've gone and yeah and they've they seem to be one of the teams that still haven't managed to sort of really sort out their portion problems you see it going down the main straight in bahrain and you wonder how either lewis or george have any teeth left you're absolutely right there they're getting a ride of their life um in that car um they are struggling somewhat with that balance um a lot of teams to be fair do seem to be but it does seem to have persisted with mercedes um the side pod design seems to be trying to help with sealing of the underfloor itself they've got a lot of um floor surface area to play with whereas others have blocked it off with side pods going for undercuts like we're seeing in red bull and we'll get to them later um if Mercedes can get on top of this, then we know where they're going to be. There's no question, shadow over that, that they will not be competitive. But it's just going to take a bit of time to get on top of it. It's a very new concept for everybody. And having been in the championship fight, uh, uh, they will have naturally not had, well, they have the resources, but they are still going to restrict to themselves being pushing all the way through to last year. Whereas others, as we've seen, have made better use of their slim a limited amount of time um 
So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this one progresses. They may struggle in Bahrain. They may, it, they may not get that win, as Lewis has been saying. Um, but I don't count on that being a persistent issue, let's be honest. Yeah, I mean, the teams will, teams will all solve these, these problems. This is what they do. As the whole point of developing a car is solving the problems and, of course, porpoising being one of the, the main ones caused by these new regulations. So I'm sure Mercedes have enough smart people working on a Brackley to, <laughs> to uh, figure it out. Uh, Tom, I'm going to move on to possi- what people are calling like the most competitive car this year or possibly the fastest car this year, and that is Ferrari. They've looked strong not only in Barcelona, but in this test in Bahrain. They've been always near or top of the timesheets. They've been putting a lot of laps. And they seem very confident in themselves. Like the, the whole aura around Ferrari right now is that very confident. Do you think that this year may be Ferrari's year, finally, after so many uh, it certainly could be, and we saw and we heard last year that they were putting a lot of development resources into 2022, um, and 2021 was almost taking a back step, if you like. Um, testing looks good for them. You know, they didn't seem to have any reliability issues. There was one day when they were absolutely pounding in the laps. I think they did 400 and something laps. Um, I could be making the figures completely up, but I seem to remember there being certainly one day where they had done an absolute shed load of laps where they were just going round and round and round. We didn't hear about them breaking down or having ele- electronic issues or you know, mechanical issues or you know, any issues with the hybrid systems. Didn't hear any sort of real complaints from the drivers. Obviously, you know, they might not have said anything, but you'd have heard or you'd have seen if there would have been major issues. They look consistent. They look solid. They look quick. Um, obviously, you know, testing is always a bit of an unknown quantity, like we said. So we don't know what fuel level they were running. We don't know if they were, you know, if they were doing push laps, if they were doing you know, sort of like specific race simulations, all the rest of it. But based on what we have seen and the sort of information we can gather from it, there's a good possibility that Ferrari will be right up there. And it would be nice to see them back up there. Hopefully they can try and do it legally this time, unlike 2019. Yes, uh, good thing. Uh, we'll see where the edge of regulations come in in 2026 if they try anything uh, <laughs> sneaky there. But um, Aaron, it's, yeah, like we, we said, like testing is a known. I think that should be a big thing that we say at the top of this podcast. Like, it's just testing, everyone. It's not, <laughs> you know, guarantee what's actually going to happen next week in Bahrain. But I think one of the most encouraging things about Ferrari that we've seen is that both drivers have been consistently able to do similar lap times in testing. They've always managed to clearly, whatever programs they're running, both drivers are quite, well, very much able to get to achieve it and get the most out of the car. Yeah, they've been pretty much up at the top of the timesheets, no matter what run plan they've been on. There's always been a Ferrari towards the top five maybe fastest or second fastest and they they look generally well placed to be in the hunt and they've got two drivers who are chomping at the bit to do it but it's interesting that they are also playing down the fact that they're fastest they're like oh no no it's just mercedes playing games but ferrari have always been the first ones to try and hype things up and then fall flat on their faces and then get shouted at by the tifosi so if they can manage expectations early on, I think they'll put themselves in a stronger position to deal with the pressure. There's none of this, oh, we are coming to win the World Championship this year. There's just a little bit of um, scepticism to what they're doing. But generally across the board, everyone in the paddock has been saying about the Ferrari, it looks good and it seems to be going as well as it looks, which is really positive for Charles and for Carlos. Because in there, they've got a driver who can knock out an ace qualifying lap, but they've also got a driver who can deliver on a Sunday and just get to the flag. I mean, Sainz finished every race last season, and consider how crazy that year was. That's impressive. Yeah, I've always said that Carlos Sainz is one of the, one of the most underrated drivers on the grid, and I think um, people are starting to realise just how good he is. 
and maybe if Ferrari are able to deliver the goods this year, which most people seem to think that they will, then maybe he could challenge. But they may have some stiff competition from Red Bull, Jack. Um, they also turned up to Bahrain with some new side pods and a new um, design to their car and looked went pretty much under the radar for the first two days until Max Verstappen started setting some quite mean lap times. Yes, uh, well, on the final day. Uh, how how highly do you rate Red Bull's chances this year? Very. Um, I think we'd be fools to think they wouldn't be up there. Same as with Mercedes. Um, they haven't really hit any issues. And like you say, when they decided to uncork Max, he was flying. Um, that new sidepod design is it is quite interesting. We've got a bit more. Uh, they, they are. You see it at the at the front leading the leading edge, leading edge of the floor the uh, sort of not quite turning veins um, but the sort of guide the air guides to one of the floor are a bit more pointed towards the center of the chassis to try and generate a vortex and then start sealing the floor a bit more efficiently. Um, they're the only team I've seen so far to start actually increasing their ride height, which means that their porpoising issues are me- being minimised. If they can raise the ride height then as the uh, downforce builds up, it doesn't get so low to the point that it stalls. It just stays at a flat level. Um, certainly, we don't, they don't seem to be damaging their floor as much as the others, um, with it actually coming into contact with the road. So, they're so they, they seem to be really getting on top of this um, as time has gone on. And I think they are in with a very good shout of making a run for it at the certainly opening half of this season. Yeah, I mean, they are, you know, the Max has got a, a driver's championship behind him now. There's kind of a level that Mercedes, uh, not Mercedes, uh, Red Bull will want to be achieving. They, they got the driver's championship last year. That they, they're, they're going to want to go for the constructors this year. And Tom, you know, they, as I said, they kind of just went about their business. They didn't really have any technical issues. Um, both drivers seem to be getting on fairly well with the car. Um, yeah, I mean, we we kind of expected Red Bull to maybe not be as competitive because it looked like they threw too many um, too many eggs in the twenty twenty one basket. But it does look like they they they've created somewhat of a competitive, well, very competitive twenty twenty two car. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think for them, because they've come into the season with a bit more stability, in the sense that there were never really any question marks around Perez's seat or, you know, there are, there are a couple of sort of murmurs here and there, but he more than proved why he's in that second Red Bull seat. So not, not only that, he's obviously an experienced driver. You know, he's been on, I think this is going to be his 10th or 11th year of the grid. Um, I can't remember what he made his debut. I think 2011, um, so, uh, yeah. Poss- yeah, possibly with McLaren. Um, or is it Salva? I can't remember. It doesn't Salva. matter. Yeah, um, you know. So he's been around the block a few times, and he's he's been at different teams, and he and you know, he obviously gets on well with the team. And yes, he brings sponsorship, but Red Bull have also, you know, brought their own enormous sponsorship in with you know with um, Oracle signing you know you know that um that title sponsorship and by bit or whatever they're called, you know, being plastered all over the car. So you know, so so the money side does help, but what what Perez brings in in terms of his his knowledge, his experience, um, and and also I think Red Bull have realised that they can't just have a car that's set up purely for Max because let's be fair, ever since I'd say twenty eighteen, that's pretty much what they were doing, um, and we saw and we saw it in abundance with um, with Dazzly and with um, Albon. Well, they just could not get to grips with the car. Now Perez has got to grips with the car. Excuse me, you know he put in some storming defensive races, um, and 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 all the rest of it. So Red Bull have come into this season a bit more settled on on, on, a, on a bit more sort of sure footing. Um, and obviously with Max having the championship, you know that's going to give them, you know that, that's that's going to give them a sort of sort of natural boost anyway. But they've um, yeah they 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 they, 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 just, they just seem a bit more. I suppose settled is the word I'd use because they've because they've been very sort of 
chop and change recently, and we know how ruthless the Red Bull Driver Academy can be. Um, but um, but no, but no, this year th- they're looking good. And and when Max started pumping in all those quick laps uh, yesterday or, or the day before, it was like okay, they they could have something up their sleeve. But again, it's testing. You know, we don't know. Yeah, exactly. We still we still <laughs> very much in the dark. It's only testing really just offers only a very small glimpse of what we might see. So, Aaron, we're going to move on to McLaren. Now, they had a very good time in Barcelona. They looked very solid. People were going, wow, McLaren's quick. They come to, to Bahrain, wow, they're still quick. But they can't seem to stop the car <laughs> now. Um, I think it's their front brakes. They're having some serious issues with it. And it really restricted their running. Never to, uh, never to forget that also the fact that Daniel Ricciardo was not even in the car for any of the three days. It's been a bit of a tough week. Yeah, I think they've they've described their front brakes as uh, crispy, so <laughs> which is pretty accurate. That's a pretty major issue, is you know over overheating front brakes and not being able to stop the car, especially when you've got a guy like Daniel Ricciardo who wants to be driving that car and jumping on the brakes as late as possible. Obviously, it wasn't helpful that uh, Ricardo was out with COVID, but the fact that Lando did all three days actually means they can get, uh, well, it can work well, but it can also work against them because having the same driver in means they can get one driver's read on every single change that they're making. Um, And then also the front brakes meant that he got a rest because he wasn't overworked. So they only did 199 laps, which doesn't sound too many, but that's all with one driver, which is plenty. Um, I think they've got a solution coming for Bahrain, and they need to hope that that works. Otherwise, you know, they could lock out the front row and then just have to coast around turn one after the start, which would be quite an interesting way of taking that corner. So it would lead to a very, very exciting first lap, that's for sure. I mean, Barcelona showed that the car handles well, and that's generally a good barometer of how well your car is designed in terms of aerodynamics and general performance. So the, the, all hope isn't lost yet for McLaren. As long as they don't toast their brakes, then they're going to be at least there or thereabouts, top of the midfield, maybe pushing the top three teams if they're not already one of the top teams on pure pace already. Um, obviously they're going to pin all their hopes on Lando next weekend because Ricardo coming back from COVID, I don't expect him to perform anything like his best. Um, we, we don't really know what his symptoms are as far as I've seen. I don't know if he's asymptomatic or if it's mild or, I think or whatever. It's asymptomatic at the moment. Okay. Um, but still the, the general performance level might be lower. And even if he's not there, they they could call on Oscar Piastri, which, could be quite fun, but he hasn't driven the car. So, you know, it's a bit of a free hit for, for him and McLaren maybe get a look at a future driver who could be on the market. It could work out, but all hope's not lost for McLaren. They're looking all right. Um, they've just got to throw some some coolness on those brakes. Yeah, I, I hope for Daniel Ricciardo's sake that he is all good and we'll see him on the grid next weekend not only because I think Ricardo is a great driver but also it'll protect the fact that there still won't be a driver younger than me who started a race in Formula 1 <laughs> Oscar Piastri is looking like he's going to be the person to to take that from me um, but Jack as Aaron mentioned like McLaren seemed to have designed a good car uh, like and if this brake upgrade or brake solution that they their shipping for the Grand Prix works. It could make McLaren a bit more competitive. I think the only reason any doubts that people have about McLaren is mostly because of those front brakes. Yeah, it's a it's quite a startling issue to have come across, and it was catching a lot of people's attention because it's normally with that you just open up the ducts and it's fine. But nothing they were seem to doing with airflow was solving the issue it's almost like the the drum or whatever was hanging on to the heat it just wasn't exiting through the wheel so on um so yeah they are they do seem a touch worried um so it is gonna be 
quite interesting to see what happens when we get to next weekend. Um, but yeah, as you say, the car itself does look very solid, very pliable. Maybe not the easiest to drive, as it does seem a bit more clunky in the slower corners. It seems to struggle a bit more than some. But if it's a if they can work with um, a bit of a sprinter, something that they sort of have to push hard to get the best out of, and then try and adjust their race strategies to suit, they might have something that can start challenging to get to the podium a bit more often than they were last year. The only thing that would worry us with that is Ferrari do seem to have taken that step forward. So it just depends if Mercedes are not as good as they should be, how far back have they gone? Yeah, it's, I think we're all, all in agreement. We really can't wait to see what maybe even just free practice is like uh, next week, just to try and figure out some sort of of order for these. Because if McLaren are able to sort these breaks, just, just how competitive can they be? Because I think a lot of people after Barcelona were really hyping McLaren and thinking that they they could be, you know, on to compete for more podiums and more wins this year. But yeah. Uh, no front brakes, and then they may, uh, they may be uh, uh, not finishing quite a few of the races this year. But uh, I'm sure they'll probably get it fixed in the end. Uh, so, Tom, we're going to move on to Alpine now. Now, they didn't have a great testing in Barcelona. Their car did, well, just completely give up on them at one point. Um, but they've come to Bahrain. They've had, you know, some running issues. They've but otherwise, they've generally just been getting on with it and just getting the laps in with um, Ocon and Alonso. But otherwise, there's nothing really too much to shout about Alpine. You know, we were expecting maybe something a bit more competitive or a bit better showing by now. Yeah, um, Alpine, they almost seem like, uh, I, I don't want to say an unknown quantity, but, um, you know, it's sort of, Coming into sort of the seat, coming into the season, coming into testing, I'm sure I heard or read a comment. I mean, you know, it's the internet, so take it with a pinch of salt. But but, um, but it was it was saying that uh, Alpine were going down the route of the, the it, it'll either be they were going to sacrifice reliability in in the name of performance. Um, whether that's actually holding true or not, I don't know. Um, but. I hope not, because do you really think Alonso will be happy with that? And do you really think it's part of our plan? Um, but um, but yeah, uh, I've got to be honest, I didn't actually see much of them in testing, mainly because I, d- I didn't actually watch any of the testing live, which doesn't exactly help. Um, you know, aside from Latifi's car bursting into flames, that's legit the only thing I saw live. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I mean... It looks like the midfield could be so tightly contested this year anyway. I mean, we say that every year. But this year, you know, if, if Haas are back on it, you know, if, if Aston Martin can can get back up there, you know, if, if, if Williams are back up there, it, it, there could be not much difference between the team that finishes fourth and the team that finishes eighth this year. And we could be coming down to these fine margins. And if that Renault power unit in the back of that car is just lacking that bit of HP... Um, especially given we know historically how powerful the milk units are, um, you know, the, the Honda units that are in the Red Bulls and, and the Ferrari power unit is looking decent this year. Um, if Alpine can't get their package together, um, you know, they might have a bit of a tired time. And if that does happen, I wonder if uh, Alonso would sign off from F1 again because he's not exactly a spring chicken and he's not going to want to sit around in a car that's going to be towards the back of the grid look at his time with McLaren um, so so yeah so uh, with, with regards to the actual team uh, do not, I don't know um, I'd like to see them like right in the midfield because you know because because Alonso as much as I don't like him he's a sensational driver and when he's when he's on it in a race we all know how good he is um, but yeah I, I just Alpine are a weird one this year because after after 2020, I thought, you know, when they had that year, their last year as, as quote-unquote Renault, so I just managed to kick one of my caps. Um, you know, they, they were, you know, they, they, I, I thought they were going to be, like, doing bits in 2021, but they weren't. Um, I know Ockham won and blah, 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 but, you know, they, they were a bit underwhelming. So, 
I don't know. They're very French about it, aren't they? The only thing you can say is expect and expected. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. Um, I mean, Aaron, I think he's right in the fact that we just, we really just don't know. I mean, there's so, this, this midfield can be so hotly contested. You know, Haas have been looking good. Uh, we'll get onto them later as well as Alpha Tari have been looking, um, you know, fairly good. And Alpine, they're either keeping their clo- uh, cars close to the chest or they just really don't have anything to show that they're going to be competing near the front of that midfield this year. I think they're going to be mired in the midfield. Well, I, I say midfield. I think it's just going to be Mercedes, Red Bull and Ferrari and then maybe McLaren somewhere flitting in between the top three and four and then everybody else because like the, the general midfield is so close and there doesn't really seem to be any one team that's like massively dropped the ball, hugely off the pace. And perhaps we have to thank the, that sliding scale of wind tunnel time for sort of balancing that out, giving teams like Haas and Alfa Romeo a little bit more opportunity to, to, to test things. Um, and with Alpine... It's difficult to read exactly where they are. I sort of echo Tom's sentiments on it. Ocon was quick on day two in the morning. I think it was fastest of anybody at lunchtime on the second day. And Alonso had a decent day um, on the final day. Although then I think they had a bit of a glory run because he ended up third fastest. And that was kind of out of nowhere. Uh, and I'm not sure how good Alonso is going to look in pink either. A, 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 a pink Alpine doesn't look quite right. Um, it's just yeah. a racing point back on the grid, isn't it? <laughs> it, it does very much feel like the racing point is back on, on the grid. It does look strange, but we've only got to put up with it in Bahrain and Jeddah. So yeah. <laughs> before it goes Bring back, back to the blue. blue. <laughs> well, it's a blue with a bit of pink. I think at the moment it's pink with blue, and then it's going to just go with, to blue with pink. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to say really about Alpine. Uh, nothing sort of really ever jumped out of me during the sort of the last three days. So we'll move swiftly on to AlphaTauri, Jack. Another team, you know, Yuki was out there doing laps on the final day. He seems to be getting pretty comfortable with the car. Same with Pierre Gasly. I think they were just out there just running programs. They weren't really having any problems that I think they got the third over the two tests I think they got like the third most amount of laps out of all the teams you know that's just that's just solid running isn't it it's it's what you come to expect from a team like Alfatari um through testing yeah just getting that mileage under uh, they're not going to be expecting to be vaulting up the grid um I think we saw last year that the car was there but maybe, well, certainly Yuki was maybe letting the side down in terms of consistency. It's getting a bit crashy. Um, so, yeah, if they could just focus on getting a consistent um, point score out of it, then they will massively improve on what they had last year um, just by finishing races where they should be, even not chasing that massive uh, that performance gain. Um, so yeah, that's all you can really say from them. They are doing what they need to do. Um, then, uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a good start. Um, they will always be well supported with that Red Bull connection, as we know. So, um, yeah, it, it, not really much to add, to be fair. Yeah, I don't know about you, Tom. I'm not really <laughs> too, uh, too sure on what to say. I mean, AlphaTauri, they've been chasing that sort of like fifth place in the constructors to try and get that, you know, I think um, Franz Toss is very keen on, you know, getting that fifth place in the constructors championship, getting the highest that they've ever been. And, you know, we we were already talking about earlier just how hotly contested this midfield could be. Is is there a chance that AlphaTauri, if they just stay consistent, have uh, Gasly, who we know is a consistent driver, have Yuki settle in a bit better in his second season, start scoring points more consistently. It could be a could be a good route for them to um to make it to fifth in the constructors. Yeah, so um you know, I think a lot of us think this is going to be Dance's last year in the Alpha Tower. Um 
where he'll go after that, we don't know. You know, we'll see what happens at some of the top teams. Looking at you, Hamilton, um, but um, yeah, it, it, it does seem like Sonoda's more sort of settled in, uh, you know, in, into the team ever since Salfatari moved him from Milton Keynes to Faenza last year. He did seem to sort of settle in, and through the through the second half of the season, he started to have some really really decent performances. And his final race of the season last year was really good. You know, I think he came he came fourth or fifth in the Alphatari in Abu Dhabi. So hopefully that'll give him some confidence, and hopefully if he just calms down a bit, you know, in, instead of shouting effing and blinding over the over the radio, you know, he, you know, you know, I, I know I know getting caught in heat in the moment, all the rest of it, but. It's not going to do the team any, you know, what it didn't do the team any favors when, when he was, you know, swearing his head off and saying, no, it's, you know, the, the car's cack or the rest of it. So, yes, yeah, so, so this year, you know, we, we, we've seen good testing from him so far. The car looks solid. It looks like he's taking on a bit more of the Red Bull philosophy as well, because historically the Alpha Tari has usually been a more sort of balanced car, whereas, whereas, whereas the Red Bull has obviously been. You know, especially since Max has been their main driver, it's been a lot more sort of not delicate, but almost oversteery in, in the way you have to drive it into the corners because Max likes to, you know, Max really likes to wring the neck of that car. Um, so it's interesting that Alpha Tari have gone that way a little bit. Obviously, they've still got to have the car sort of set for their drivers, all the rest of it. Um, but it, it would be nice to see them get fresh, you know, because because they've been really sort of punching above their weight recently. Um, and I think if Sonoda would have scored more points last year, I think they could have finished higher in the championship. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so let's just hope for a good year from them and that he can reach the pedals. Yeah. I will say, like, if anyone who hasn't watched uh, Drive to Survive, um, uh, Yuki's sort of episode in it is actually probably the one and only highlight I have from it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite good. And I love how Will Buxton explains that he probably learned his he learned his English on the sideline from mechanics <laughs> casting tracks. No wonder he he swears so much and he's so um, vocal with it. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I do love Yuki, and I, I hope he um, hope he sticks around for for a while. But uh, Aaron, we'll move on to Aston Martin. We've got a beautiful car this year. Just not too sure whether it's all that quick. I mean they. They never really showed any signs. They were just kind of just plodding along. I mean, they, I think on day two, I think it was, they had some sort of glitch. It was either day one or day two. They had some glitch and they lost a lot of running time. Um, I think it was when Vettel was in the car, which is going to set them back a bit. But I don't know. The start of this five-year plan doesn't seem to be all that promising. Well. But- well, the ultimate pace is unknown at the moment, but maybe they were just letting everyone admire their lovely livery by going slowly for us. Um, you know, it is really beautiful. So, um, yeah. I mean, I'll make a little bit. They, they got plenty of laps in overall across the three days, 339. And that glitch aside with, where Seb took his little detour to the outer loop, I mean, maybe he wanted to, check that one out as a Sochi replacement. So uh, we'll see. It was fairly serene for Aston Martin. There was only that real issue. No other major problems in terms of reliability that I noted. But again, the big question is simply how fast is it? It's, it's one of those questions. And of course, if they went fast, we could just go, oh, well, it's testing their running low fuel and we don't have the full picture. So we're not going to find that out until... You know, next weekend and then maybe the weekend after as well, exactly where everyone's relative pace is to each other. But on the whole, I think Aston Martin look in good shape. They don't seem to be pressing the top guys just yet. Um, I still think they're getting to grips with having all this cash flying around the building and not really knowing what to do with it. And, and uh, Lawrence Stroll's scripted speeches to try and rally the troops. Um, I'm not sure they'd rally me to do more work, but that's beside the point. Um, they, they seem like they're going to be sort of where they are from last year. They're in the midfield, maybe pinching a few podiums and uh, high points finishes. But considering they're developing their facilities back at Silverstone, 
that's not a bad place to be. We've seen teams try to develop their infrastructure and fall down the order. So uh, staying where you are while building, that that's still moving forward. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I could really, the only thing I really spotted, Jack, from the uh, from the Aston Martin is just through the slow corners. It did look quite understeery. It did seem to be. I don't want to say like sluggish, but it just did, did seem to be a bit um, struggling a little bit. And I'm sure that's something that they'll be keen to just really be hopping on this development race and try and make sure that car is competitive because the last thing Aston Martin need if the uh, midfield is so close is to be left behind. Yeah, it's um, it's not a great start. It's sort of we're, It seems like we're going to have an Aston underperforming from what you would expect, a bit similar to what we had last year, certainly at the start of this. But as you mentioned the development is going to be vicious through this year while everyone shakes things out and sees where they, uh, what works and what doesn't. Um, I would be surprised if they didn't start copying someone like Ferrari, assuming that worked. Um, we all of a sudden have the green Ferrari rather than the pink Mercedes. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting one, but yeah, they are somewhat underperforming and you are onto something with the sluggishness in low speed i think their car might be a bit on the heavy side i from what i've read but again you know you gotta be careful what you uh, what you take for, for uh, as read on the internet um but then a lot of people a lot of teams seem to be running a bit overweight so we'll see how uh, how that one plans out but yeah they um they certainly have a lot of room for improvement if you want to keep this diplomatic <laughs> yes uh, we we will keep this diplomatic otherwise i feel like uh, Lawrence Stroll's mafia squad might be on to us <laughs> if we're not too careful about what we say. Um, so on that note, we'll swiftly move on to Haas, Tom. And you know what? I'm going to say it. Haas don't actually look that bad. I think their gamble in 2021 of not developing their car and, and then sort of moving it into all their resources into 2022 seems to look like it's paid off. I don't think they're the slowest... Um, from what I've seen, I don't think they're the slowest cut on the grid. And they've got rid of one of their main issues is that they've no longer got Nikita Mazepin and they've brought back Kevin Magnussen. So surely it can't be looking too bad at half this season. Yeah, as I press all the wrong buttons on my mouse. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, it's nice to see k Mac back, in it? You know, he's... Uh, yeah, he, he, he's 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 been a proven quantity in that car before, so it's, it'll be good for Haas to have someone who's got experience as well and proper experience, and I mean racing experience, not bribery experience. Um, you know, unlike Mazepin. Um, so, yeah, uh, we were talking about this briefly before we went on air, and we were saying that obviously Haas have put a lot of their well, all their development resources into twenty twenty two. From sorry, last year they put all the resource developments into this year. Um, it looks like it's initially paying off, and especially now that they haven't got those ties to Yurikali and Mazepin and Putin and whoever else, um, it could actually work out really well for them. Uh, and you know, Mazepin coming back, uh, sorry, not Mazepin, um, K Mag coming back in. It can only be a good thing for the team because we've seen how good he is, apart from, you know, even with that salty tweet from Marcus Ericsson. Um, I don't know if anybody saw that. Um, yeah. Uh, and and then, you know, hopefully Schumacher can learn off learn off K-Mag this year. Um, maybe not quite teaching Holtenberg how to suck his balls, but, um, you know, but, you know, but, but, but certainly... Um, you know, but certainly some race crafts and some car development stuff. And also history has taught us, I seem to have said that a lot in this podcast, um, but we have certainly seen in the past that um, Schumacher tends to come good in his second season. And in Schumacher, uh, to give Schumacher credit where it's fully deserved, we only had one race last year where we saw him actually legit battling with other people, and that was in Hungary when the order was mixed up. And he was putting in a damn good show in a car that was easily the worst on the grid. So if Schumacher has a better car underneath him, he gets a bit more experience under his belt um, with an experienced teammate like K-Mag alongside him. 
it could be good. Um, and I'm just I'm relieved for Haas in general as well because uh, the whole Mazepin thing. I mean, I don't know if anybody listening has seen the drive, has seen Drive to Survive and specifically the Haas episodes, but the whole aura in the garage. Oh my god, it felt horrible. It felt, uh, you know, it, you know, it, it 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 legit felt like Mazepin Senior was sort of like pulling the puppet strings, which is what he was because he was because he was saying. You know, because all the stuff you're saying about you know pulling out his funding if you know results can improve and convince this son had a different car, no mate, he's just shit. Um, you know, so it's hopefully all that sort of I don't want to sound like all spiritual, but hopefully that sort of bad energy is gone. Having having K Mag back, you know, it, it, it'll it's looking promising for Haas, and they had they had a good testing. I mean, I, I know they had a couple of reliability issues and they were delayed with their freight arriving, but. That's that was the freight issue was out of their control. Testing, yeah, it, yeah, okay, it's not ideal that they saw these issues, but in some ways, it's actually good that they saw these issues because that's what testing is there for. So they can work out these issues, they can work out these weak points, um, and then you know whether it's a manufacturing issue, whether whether it's um, you know whether it's a sort of fitment issue, you know, a fundamental design philosophy, they can go from there and potentially fix it. So. It's nice to see, you know, it, it is nice to see them sort of pumping in these quick laps and just the car looking better, the team looking more relaxed, looking more settled, um, just looking happier. They're just vibing and it's good. Yeah, that's what F1's all about. It's all about the vibes and we're, we're liking the vibes that are coming from us. Pos- positive vibes. Positive vibes. But, um, yeah, I mean, Aaron, they were they had the extra time so far on the second of second and third day uh in which they did send both drivers out just to set very fast uh lap times and go on those glory runs but i think from what i've read and what i've heard from various other uh teams they they are genuinely concerned about the potential that Haas have and how you know they obviously they're not going to jump from last on the grid to getting podiums but they could they are being seen as someone who could be a serious challenger in that midfield, someone who maybe nabs up, you know, 10th or 9th place, you know, every few Grand Prix. Yeah, certainly some good news for Haas. You know, they've got rid of Mazepin, you know, they've played a bit of a blinder there, got the uh, the extra wind tunnel time, developed the car with his money and then managed to get rid of him. So, you know, happy days. Um yeah, they did go on a couple of glory runs, didn't they, towards the end of days two and three? But why not? You know, that, that team has had, you know, a bit of a a rough few years. Some of it is their own making. I mean, let, let's be honest, Gene Haas should be putting money in his pocket because he's got it. Not well, not just because he's got it, but it's his team. It's got his name on it. You know, and that, that is literally his name being dragged through the mud at the back of the grid. So... It was good to see them get some some the, the good vibes, as, as we're now calling them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and that, that's only going to be improved by uh, Kevin Magnussen coming back, and he seems really pleased to be there. The whole mood around Haas has changed. Like, it was all doom and gloom last season. It was, oh, Mazepin this, Mazepin that. They haven't got money. They're not developing the car. Poor Mick Schumacher. I mean, obviously, poor Mick Schumacher, because he had to <laughs> suffer that car last year. But... It, it, it looks much more positive now, even, even if they still are last, even if they're not as last as they were last year. And I don't think they will be last because like the McLaren was on track, the Haas car looked pretty quick, pretty decent, and it showed with the times. So there, there is definite hope for Haas that they can achieve some points finishes this season. And in Kevin Magnussen, they've got someone who can wrestle that car into the points and, you know, he's got the spicy language to back it up afterwards. Yes, uh, in- incredibly spicy as <laughs> uh, seen in the past. But uh, no, I think it's it's good news for Haas. And uh, those glory runs and them being so far at the table reminded me of, of 2018 when, uh, or 2019, no, 2019, sorry, when uh, <laughs> William Story would tweet it during testing that, Haas were faster than Red Bull despite like them just being like maybe like two tenths faster on like the first day of testing. I was like, 
you got it. It's it's just nice to see see them back up there, but uh, obviously it's not going to last long. I don't expect a, a Haas locking up the second <laughs> the second or third row uh, when it comes to the actual race uh, next weekend. But um, Jack, we'll move on to to Williams now, and they have been the team that I would argue have not struggled the most, but they've had the most issues. They've not been able to get the running. The car it hasn't been looking the best, and I think it's, I think it's a bit of a, it's put a bit of a downer. We're all expecting Williams to really come on this revival, and they've just been hit with so many issues that it now really puts them on the back foot because they just lost so much time to, um, because of all these issues that kept sort of cropping up. Yeah, it's um, it has been a bit worrying. Not only have they had lost all this time, uh, lost all this testing time, but the pace also hasn't been there. I know we can't use times, but they've never. It's not like you you can kind of guess, uh, get get some sort of indication that like Ferrari have always been in the top four regardless of what they've done. But Williams have just sort of never really had anything to sort of indicate they had good pace in that car. Um, and then, as you say, they have lost an awful lot of time of on-track action just dealing with issues. I mean, hell, the brake fire on, uh, in Bahrain, Jos Capito saying that was an issue too stupid to talk about, um, i.e. a procedural issue, not a component failure. Someone forgot to take a blanking plate out or something like that. Um, and the result of which was pretty catastrophic foul suspension and two fried um well brake and suspension uh, sets maybe even the motors so yeah that's they are very much on the back foot here um hopefully it won't last uh we don't know how good that the aero concept is long term they what we are seeing though is that people are going to be stuck in it and they've gone down the Mercedes side of things rather than the Ferrari side. So they've clearly put their eggs on that on that basket. So they are going to have to hope that it pays out and they can just work these kinks out and make up the, make up for the lost time in testing very quickly. Yes, I'm sure they'll be uh, they'll be double triple checking that they've got everything out of the rear brake ducts before they uh, they send it out on track this time. And um, yeah, cause a massive fire. Which something also did explode. I don't know if any watched the footage of, of it. I think it was just a tire failure. Yeah, <laughs> it looked quite dramatic when Latifi was trying to put the car out, and then suddenly you just see a big puff of smoke coming out the back of the car. And you're thinking, oh dear, what's, what's just exploded? But um, Tom, yeah, like I think people people are really wanting Williams to to come back on it. They want them to come back. They want them to just you know look good again. We saw so much promise last year, and we thought because you know, they've still got quite a bit of wind tunnel time because they finished eighth in the um, in the constructors, but it just comes down to their sort of their, just the fundamentals of just how the team is being run and the way that, you know, their car is just being built. And it, it's sad to say, but Williams could be at the back again and it's just not a place that we ever really want to see them. Yeah, um, I was full of optimism and hope for Williams for this year. But seeing how the others have sort of progressed around them uh, and the sort of... uh, It's just not looking good, I don't think. Um, And, you know, they've got a decent driver lineup. Don't get me wrong. You you know, uh, know, Albon is is a proven proven quantity. And Latifi is better than, than I think he gets recognition for. But... I think it could be another tough year for them. Um, I think aside from maybe Alfa Romeo, I think it could be Williams and Alfa at the back. Uh, hopefully not with a huge sort of deficit or void to the midfield, but looking at the progress that Haas have made, for example, uh, I don't think they're going to be that far up the field. It pains me to say it. Um, especially as a car that's absolutely banging, but... Um, yeah, you know, you know, you know. So it's, uh, it's all fart and no poo at the minute. That car, you know, it looks good, but it don't go. Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, it's another good way of putting that. Um, Aaron, yeah, I, I don't know what to say about Alfa Romeo because 
they haven't looked terrible, but the the reliability issues that they've been having, the amount of glitches that they kept having with their system, which would um, stop their running prematurely. But the, the car itself has shown some potential, probably more than I would say Williams at the moment, that it could ha- it could be still in that midfield race. But at the moment, I'm very confused on where it actually may sit in terms of the actual pecking order. Well, there, there's a there's one key thing that we should recognise that is in that car, and that is Valtteri Bottas and all the bad luck that he brings to the team from his time at Mercedes. Because if it can go wrong, it will go wrong for Valtteri. Um, you know, it, it was a much better test than what they had in Barcelona. I mean, I didn't, I don't even remember seeing them in Barcelona. Did you see them? <laughs> so it, it's. It's just been a bit of a. Uh, the car looks nice, the, but it's not been as fruitful as it could potentially have been, because they've just been set back time and again with small problems. And you know how quick is that car compared to the rest? There are still so many question marks over that. I mean, if they are if they are performing well around Bahrain. Are they excelling specifically on the straights? Is the Ferrari power unit as powerful as people think it is? Or are they just very good in the low speed compared to everybody else? So I guess, we'll, like, like with all the teams, we'll, we'll get some answers as we go through uh, the first few races. But it, it is very difficult to see where to put Alfa Romeo. I mean, I don't have a huge amount of confidence in them to develop the car particularly well. I think Bottas will guide them. and I'm not sure Guan Yu Zhou is quite Formula One material I think he's a decent racing driver but I'm not sure he's quite F1 level so you know with, with all the bad luck that Bottas is bound to get you know and no no amount of coffee is going to make that thing go any faster if it's at the back of the grid yeah uh, I don't know they may just have to uh, spend a lot more of their money on us and porridge to get him to get him going in the morning but uh yeah like jack i mean we've we've finally been able to actually properly see the the alfa romeo for what it for what it is of course they took off that camo livery they've actually stuck a very nice looking livery uh on the car with some very nice wheel covers i don't think this is going under the radar a lot but the fact that alfa romeo have actually chosen to do something with the wheel covers to make them look a bit more interesting is is quite nice but yeah, I mean, what is what is your assessment of the, of the Alfa Romeo? Like, what do you think that they're doing particularly strongly? Because if they do have the pace, is it a or like a well designed car? Is it just going to be down to how reliable that thing is? Like, if they are actually going to get any results this year? Well, one thing I have read on repeat a lot with Alfa Romeo is that they have got on top of focusing quickly. One of few teams to have done so. So if they can rely, it means that they can lean on a balance. be a bit more consistent compared to others. We know Bartas is a formidable, um, so yeah, it's fair that he's not much it. Then they might actually have a chance of duck right at the back. I'm oh, sorry, you kind of cut out for the entirety of what you just said. <laughs> so we've not heard a word. Um, turned into a robot. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> you're mind repeating everything that you've just said. Yeah, so so Jack, of, of, unfortunately, you sounded like a stone Dalek. Great. <laughs> <laughs> no, so... <laughs> Sorry, stone Dalek's just done me. <laughs> Um, we know Bottas is a great qualifier, no doubt about that. If he can start imparting a bit more of that knowledge onto Joe to try and bring him maybe not up to well up, up a bit into F1 grade material, then their drivers are covered off. Something else I've read a lot is that they have 
got on top of their porpoising a lot quicker than others. Um, so that is certainly something that they can rely on. If they can lean on a car that has got a bit more fundamental balance than the others, um, it should mean that certainly in low speed tracks, they have a bit more of a competitive package compared to what we've seen so far. But they may have had reliability, reliability issues, but this is the time to have those issues. If they persist, then we do have the reason to worry. But right now, they might be a bit further up off the back than it seems. Okay, thank you. That's a note to editor, you're welcome. <laughs> um, so we've now gone, I believe, yes, we have now um, gone through all, all 10 teams and they're like, now I'm gonna ask you to kind of do the impossible right now, guys, and I'm gonna ask you what, in your personal opinion, after seeing six days of testing and everything that you've seen, read, I want you to, to give me your top five. Who, starting, who you think is the fastest and then giving your top five fastest cars and who you think out of all the testing. So I'll give you a second to think, <laughs> second to think about it. But Tom, I'm going to come to you first. So... Who, who would be your top five from what you've seen, what you've heard so far? In order? In order, please. What, is it one to five or five to one? You can do it which order, <laughs> whichever order you like, whichever you find easiest. Um, all right, I'm going to do five to one. I think... Fuck, I think I'll be, be fifth quickest this year. Um, I'm going to say do you know what I'm going to go all out there Haas going to be fifth quickest I'm yeah I'm putting my balls on the line and saying it um, fourth quickest McLaren third quickest it's going to rock a few feathers Mercedes Second quickest, Red Bull, quickest, Ferrari. Okay, so we have one. Uh, one between Aaron. Do you want to also go five to one or are you going to go one to five? Uh, I was going to join Tom on the uh, Has Good Vibes there with P5, but um, I think Alpha Tauri will be up there. I think if Red Bull have got a strong package, then sort of by definition, Alpha Tauri generally have a strong package. Uh, and then I think McLaren will be fourth. I think Red Bull will end up, I think they, I don't think they'll have the third fastest car, but I think they will end up third of that group. Um, just the way the team dynamic is. And then Ferrari again, second, but not, not, uh, not as in, they have the second slowest car, uh, Mercedes, top of the bunch, because I just think they have a, a better balance on things. I think once Mercedes get on top of things, they will be in a very, very good place. But Ferrari are looking incredibly strong. Red Bull look really fast. So it, it's a lucky dip, whatever order you want in that one. And, you know, heart overhead. Yeah, that's a, it's, always, it's always the best way to do it at the moment. Uh, wait till we get some actual running after Bahrain to start making real predictions. But Jack, coming to you, who, who are your top five? Mm, if I, I'm going to treat this as if, like, what are the constructors table going to look like after Bahrain? I don't, I'm not going to bother doing this after for a whole season now. Um, I will go... Fifth Alpha Tauri, uh, sorry, no, fifth McLaren, fourth Alpha Tauri, third Mercedes, second Ferrari, first Red Bull. Okay. Um, personally, for me, I'm going to go fifth Alpha Tauri, fourth Mercedes, third McLaren, second Ferrari, first Red Bull. I think. I think McLaren will get these brakes issues pretty sorted pretty quick. And I think from there they'll they'll have quite a competitive package. And I think as of now, I think I'm going as it stands like right now. I think uh, Mercedes maybe 
lacking a bit somewhat. So <laughs> that is my my top uh, top five. Um, no halves in there. <laughs> I can't. I would love to get on those good vibes, but uh, I just don't think they're quite they're quite there yet. Um, and then just sort of one final um, question to you all: Who for you has been the standout driver or team that is the, the sort of the standout for you over these sort of last two weeks of testing? Uh, we'll go reverse. So, Jack. I really comment on a driver personally, um, but I would say my standout team is probably Ferrari, having made such a noticeable gain. And it's rare to see that gain be presented so consistently throughout, especially throughout testing. So I don't think anyone's questioning that they have made a massive improvement. Well, maybe not massive, but a significant improvement. They certainly seem to worry the the the, the known hierarchy. So yeah, I'll go with them. No, uh, I think you maybe have to give it to Kevin Magnuson or to Lando Norris. Uh, Kevin for being parachuted in, sort of last minute. It was it was only announced that he was driving for Haas on Wednesday, and there he is Thursday in the car. Um, and for Lando for doing three days worth of donkey work while Daniel Ricciardo's uh, uh, in the hotel, not very well. So obviously wishing Daniel Ricciardo the best, but Lando's going to need a good rest before the rest next weekend. And Tom? Uh, for a team, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say Ferrari. I was going to say Haas, but I'm going to say Ferrari. I'm going to echo pretty much everything that Jack said. You know, so consistent, su- such a good improvement in all areas of that car. Um, you know, looking very, very promising for them. I hope that I hope that they can deliver on it. Um, and for a driver, I'm going to I'm going to agree with Aaron. I'm going to say Lando because being parachuted in to do three whole days of testing, I cannot begin to imagine how much that would have taken out of him. How knackered he'll have been. So for him to do those three days just, you know, just banging out lap after lap after lap, you know, you know, diff, you know different runs, different fuel loads, all the rest of it, um, especially as it's going to be bloody hot in Bahrain as well, you know, to, to be in that cockpit for all that time. Yeah, fair play to it. Yeah, for me, I think my standout team is definitely, I'm going to say Haas. I mean, Ferrari have uh, been looking quick, but we kind of all expected Ferrari to be to be quick. I don't think we've really um, expected Haas to be uh, potentially where they are. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what um, Haas uh, have to offer uh, this season. I gave them a lot of stick. <laughs> I think this podcast in general gave them a lot of stick last year. And I'm just, I'm just kind of loving what's happened with the team starting with the fact that Mazepin was Keat out um, and I can't wait to see what Kevin Magnussen can do but yeah also a big shout out to Lando Norris I'm sure he'll be uh, taking it easy during free practice on, on Friday and Daniel taking a bit more of the reins on that but uh, yeah I think it'll be interesting to see what McLaren can do so that um, that is all from us today um, of course we are currently live streaming the show so if you are watching the live stream and you are new make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn the bell notification to be notified anytime that we go live um, we do this with I think from now on we're going to be doing this with all of our shows as we head into the 2022 season starting of course in well tomorrow actually if you're watching this now it um, will be live streaming the preview to the um to the 2022 barring grand prix and then from there we'll be doing qualifying and race reviews of every single one of the 23 races that are scheduled well 22 scheduled so far 23 that will happen though um this season so yeah if you are new and you want to um get all of our content yeah just hit that subscribe button and hit the bell notification um we're not only available just on YouTube, but we're also available on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Omni Studio, Verbal, as well as the F1 Chronicle website. So just search for the F1 Grid Talk podcast. Um, this is episode 173. So if you are stuck with something to listen to between now 
um, and the start of the season, which is only a few days' time, um, we have a massive backlog of shows for you to listen to. One's about testing, one's about talking about the new sporting regulations that are coming um, that me and Tom did on our own, or the um, the fireside episode where we talked more at the technical regulations, because this is a big change that's coming for 2022. Um, and as well as that, we have interviews with Maria Zola, the head of Pirelli for Formula One, as well as more documentary style shows um, about Tygate, Ayrton Senna, and the 1994 Benetton conspiracy. So feel free to check them out on whichever platform you desire. Also, if you give us a five-star review on iTunes, we will give you the shout out at the start of our next show. And I believe you can now do it on Spotify as well. So if you do that as well, of course, you'll get shout out. We also have a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the podcast and help towards better mics, lights and recording equipment for our hosts, any support is greatly appreciated. And we try to make the show as good for you guys as possible. Um, so now it's on to the plugs. So where can we find the rest of you? Tom, starting with you. Where can the lovely people who listen to this find more from you? Uh, so I'm part of everything in F1. You can find us across all your social media platforms, the handle at join EF1. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think those are the main ones. Um, we have a website which recently been redone, everythingf1.com. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel, which is sadly growing, which is, you guessed it, Everything F1. Um, and our podcast, which is the Everything F1 podcast, uh, we put it out weekly, um, usually on a Wednesday or a Thursday, depending on when we can record it in the week. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that's available on, oh God, uh, Apple, Spotify, um, Amazon, our website, all your favourite podcasting locations. Nice one. And Aaron? So I uh, am the I'm the host of the Five Red Lights F1 podcast. You can find it on Spreaker, Spotify, Google, Apple, and almost everywhere else. Uh, it's also on, your, on YouTube uh, where I've got other FN, F1 videos, uh, such as The Flying Lap, where I review all the action and the headlines uh, quicker than the fastest lap time. Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter at five underscore red underscore lights and on Instagram at five red lights. I have a website which is five red lights.wixsite.com forward slash five RL pod blog, uh, where I write uh, a bunch of F1 articles as I try to become a Formula One journalist. Nice. And Jack, where can we find more from you? Uh, should you wish to find out more from me, uh, you can probably best follow me on Twitter at J underscore C underscore Watson. Um, otherwise, you can find me on the Sportlight website, uh, occasionally writing articles, uh, mainly looking into motorsport regulations and uh, history. Yeah, and yeah, God forbid you want to follow me on Twitter, where I'm at the moment just mostly crying about the loss of my football club. Um, you can follow me at L underscore G underscore Edwards. I swear I didn't take the the, the format of my app from Jack. Um, but yeah, if you want to, if you want to drop me a follow, um, go for it. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah. Finally, I just want to thank all the guests for joining me today, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow at some time. Um, if you subscribe on YouTube, you'll find out. I think it's seven o'clock tomorrow um, for the the preview for the Bahrain Grand Prix. The 22, uh, 2022 season is finally back and i can't wait for it to get started so thank you all for listening or watching or wherever you're uh, consuming our wonderful podcast uh thank you and goodbye well hey oh well that was good yeah i, I had some good analogies in that one very good. It's right, all uh, fun, no poo. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, 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 I will say I have to shoot off pretty much now. So, uh, yeah, I need to take my you. dinner's ready. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, me too. I'm going to go feed Tweedledum and Tweedledee who are currently staring at me. So, all the people on the live stream, <laughs> um, the thank you. <laughs> thank you for, for watching. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> we got to head off now. So, uh, thank you for watching and 